uh, we pride ourselves on seeing what others may not see. Uh, on the other hand, I think what we see today is fairly obvious. Uh, in Maureen O'Hara's terms, we are seeing an evolution in markets that are not equities, all right? And I'll just say that very broadly because uh, you can put almost any label on that you want, but certainly an evolution in those markets that is leading to uh, changes in market structure, uh, whether it be for FX, uh, for fixed income, for various forms of derivatives, uh, the OTC uh, swaps issue, all right, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, some of this has been driven by regulatory concerns. Uh, certainly some of that comes out of the financial crisis. Uh, overseas, some of it is driven again by regulatory concerns, but in the sense of best execution. I think uh, MIFID II is a, uh, a great example of that. Uh, on the other hand, the evolution itself is closer to what Terry Duffy was trying to uh, indicate to us in some ways, and that is that evolution is often driven not just by revenue considerations, but by cost. And uh, Terry Hendershot's paper with Anant uh, is, is an example, okay, of, uh, of that at work, I think, at least on the academic side. As a matter of fact, I think that as I listened to Terry, um, I had a flashback because I could have been listening to an equity paper 15 years ago in market structure. Uh, as a matter of fact, even the, uh, even the conclusions, right, not just methodology or the issues that were involved, were very much the same. If you change the terminology a little and replace liquid bonds by large cap stocks and illiquid bonds by small cap stocks, uh, and you start to think about it, uh, you were really talking the same debate 15 years ago. And for those of you who may either not have been there, uh, given that this is Georgetown, there must be some students here, and for those of you who would remember, uh, it used to be said that electronic trading can't happen here. Electronic markets cannot exist in equities. Uh, that is really uh, obviously been proven false uh, over time. So to illustrate that, uh, I'd like to just start with a short story to give you an idea as to what the difficulties may be, which is, in a sense, uh, echoing Richard Gorlick's comments uh, about difficulties going forward. Um, uh, once upon a time, uh, not too long ago, and actually in Washington, D.C., a committee was set up uh, that over a 14-month period actually gave birth to the idea of trace. Now, the, uh, the idea was that it was devoted to bond market transparency, and Trace was actually the result of, uh, of that exercise. And I was privileged to be part of that group. So what's the story? The story is not over the 14 months. The story is over the first five minutes. Because in that five minutes, um, a legal counsel from a large bulge bracket firm stood up, faced the SEC contingent, and said, uh, why are we here? In other words, our reading of the law says we do not even have to report prices to you. Now, that really was not so long ago, all right? You talk about lack of transparency in a market. Uh, you talk about, you know, powerful firms, you know, controlling an industry. Uh, we've come a long way in bonds since then, and uh, to the point where we can actually start to talk about that evolution, partly uh, because of the transparency in the data. But as we go through all this, uh, I think it was noted earlier by, perhaps by Richard, that uh, it was refreshing to hear Terry's paper because we spent most of the day, in fact all of the day, on equities. And, you know, we tend as academics and frankly even in the industry uh, to beat the equity markets to death. Now, I don't want to do that today and that's not what this panel is about. Uh, we, have, uh, we have three uh, very experienced people at the table. Uh, in different roles, and I uh, congratulate Rena for actually getting them all in one room at one time. Uh, Chris Rice down on the far left, uh, head of trading, head of global trading uh, for State Street Global Advisors. Uh, Andre Kirilenko, who is the uh, CFTC's chief economist and frankly does much more than that. I think uh, his reputation precedes him. Uh, and Chris Kincannon, who is now with Virtue, uh, financial, but uh, I remember him back from uh, the very early days of uh, exchange automation uh, at Island, I guess. <laughs> it was uh, uh, not that long ago either. 
And I'd actually like to start with Chris, because I should say Chris Rice, uh, saying I have that problem here, uh, to ask a question that may seem fairly obvious, but given the day, it's not so clear. And that is, given what we do know about the equity markets, I mean, what lessons can we learn uh, from the equity market evolution and following the market structure evolution that we can apply to, say, fixed income or, uh, or FX trading or anything else that comes to mind, frankly? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Ian, and thanks, Rena, for having me here today. This has been a great event. Um, just taking a step back before we get into that, uh, I liked Maureen O'Hara's comment at the end, if we build it right, they will come. And we've spent so much time today talking about market microstructure for equities. How do we start to move into really you know, the world ahead and thinking towards, towards the future? And questions like, are markets broken? And these are the questions that we talked about today. You know, is there enough transparency? Is there enough real liquidity? You know, we're talking about listed markets. And in some ways, you know, we should be very excited about the market structure that we do have for equities. You know, it's transparent. You can visibly see price formation. Um, and by and large, it's cleared. So you have this basis yet. So there might be some, I forget what the uh, term was, uh, ecosystem flaws versus bad actors. But fundamentally, that's a great base. And so, Ian, to your question, as we extend into thinking about other markets um, or even credit, which we just heard about, you know, the idea is how do we, you know, what the functions of a good market, you know, we want to see displayed trading interests. Um, you know, ideally all securities would be liquid, so you, you, you know, you'd have a lot of uh, velocity in the trading, and you'd see a real-time tape, and we talk about Trace. I mean, wow, that was a big thing when Trace came in for corporates. Uh, excuse me. So I think that the lessons we've learned, we've got the great foundation to work off, but I think as speaking from the buy side, we have to not be that sort of crossed arm, have everybody come in and sort of pitch to us. I think we really need to outreach to market participants, to our regulators, to work with them to think, how does the next iteration of over-the-counter form and, and come together? Um, and, and that's going to be a process, but I think the buy side needs to do that um, and be much more proactive um, as we advance the discussion. Mm -hmm. And the other, Chris, I guess, uh, I mean, same question. I mean, I know that, uh, you know, you're seriously involved in a lot of things these days, including FX. I mean, is there a lesson in the equities market for FX trading at this stage, or do we really need to start over, I mean, in some sense? I mean, it's a great question. I um, obviously am an equities guy uh, going into FX, and I was very concerned about my bias that I would, well, everything should trade like FX, uh, like equities, U.S. equities in, in FX. And, um, so I was, I was cautious in kind of my predictions around the evolution of the FX market, and I was overly cautious. I am now seeing um, an FX market that is going through the 1990s of the U.S. equity market. ECNs are popping up. Uh, people are building out algos and delivering kind of an agency order execution versus principle-based trading, which existed obviously throughout um, the NASDAQ market in the 90s. Uh, so FX is going through an evolution, and, and I, I look around, I look for, well, what's the driver, right? Is there a regulatory uh, event that's accelerating this evolution? And, and what I've concluded is it's all the technology that has been built and, um, you know, distributed to all the industry participants, both end users, uh, brokers, and even the dealers, and they have all this firepower, so to speak, to allow the market to automate, to see price, to aggregate price, and they're now delivering it to the same market participants in FX. And so that just the sheer technology that's being deployed to the FX arena is allowing um, the same ecosystem that exists in, in U.S. equities. It will never be the same market. There, there's no overriding consolidated tape. There's no last sale, um, it will always be a global market, but when you think about FX, I think, and, and what gets me excited is, there's only a few symbols that trade in FX, right? Mm -hmm. There's only a few symbols, it's the S&P 100 of FX symbols, and so they're very liquid, 
they trade um, broadly 24 hours a day, and it just uh, it screams of consolidation through technology, uh, through commercial means, and there's really no regulatory impetus to fix it other than you know a few you know issues among the buy side saying hey how do we get best X like we get in uh, cash equities and so a lot of those that best X analysis is making its way into FX so I do now see um, an evolution that looks uh, more like US equ equities it will never be the same but it's looking more and more like it mm -hmm. yeah we see we see the uh, best execution uh, issue as well uh, like some other firms who are now engaged in that practice. Uh, but let me ask a, a, a follow-up, uh, because you've pinned uh, the tail on technology as the driver, and it's certainly true in the FX market there have been versions, right, of electronic markets for, for some time. Uh, and even granting the idea that you'd never be able to bring this under a single regulatory jurisdiction, how much of this evolution can be ascribed simply to, let's say, the link with equity trading? Right with cross-border, I mean, is that a driver in your opinion, or do you believe that technology is really trumped, and what we're looking at is an overhaul of the FX market, regardless of why you trade? In other words, even just for alpha purposes' sake. Uh, I mean, I, absolutely. I think there's two two drivers around the technology. One is a lot of the FX activity is related to cross-border equity trading. There's always an FX lag in mm -hmm. every cross-border trade, and so. The, the users of that equity um, order um, expect the same execution quality both on the equity leg as well as on the, on the FX leg and, and the same response times and speed of execution. Um, so that's one driver. The other driver is all of this technology was built and it can easily be deployed into FX and so it's more of a cost driver. It's how are we going to solve the proliferation of FX ECNs. Well, we have an agency router that does that for cash equities. Let's put it into FX. And so I'm seeing among the banks and other brokers a deployment of equity trading technology being uh, moved into the FX arena. And mm -hmm. I'm seeing it uh, both here in the U.S. and obviously abroad. Do those links, I think for anybody on the panel, do, do those links to the other asset classes, kind of the obvious, uh, in a global environment, um, uh, do they open the door to more competition than the banks might uh, have previously thought was desirable, at least from their point of view? So the notion of agency brokers and FX? Yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting when you get into a discussion on FX, and it sounds like a lot of, of like the discussion this morning, people talk about um, electronic markets and the good piece of it in the sense that you have a central limit order book and you can observe price formation and see depth of book. Um, it makes sense. I think, um, you know, look at, there's still a very strong dealer driven component to it, but it sort of dovetails into the idea of, look, new technology, new entrants. You want to bring more sources of liquidity into any market. So to the extent that you have an economic incentive or motive to do it, um, you know, that's powerful and you're going to bring more liquidity in. And again, that just makes for a better market. Mm -hmm. uh, before I move on to Andre and uh, something a little more exotic, I, I've neglected to mention something. I, we would like to take questions from the audience, really, at, at any time. So I'd like to pause here to see if there's anything uh, intermediary uh, at this stage. Yes? Back to Chris, actually. Speaking about FX and this migration towards a more equity-like environment, I'm not that familiar with FX, but I believe that there have been some announcements. I think EBS recently announced a kind of change, trying to cordon off part of the market from those agents of change that I think your firm represents. So is that going to be, is that sort of a last ditch kind of defense, or is that maybe suggesting that we're going to see fragmentation of the market into pools of different kinds of liquidity? It's a great question. I, I, I think the EBS changes were... Um, interpreted differently by different people. Um, we don't see them as all that dramatic. They were making some adjustments to trade increments that we actually agreed with. Um, they do have notions of trade ratios uh, that people are concerned with. I think their biggest challenge is they still have end users that are clicking a screen. They have direct customers <coughs> clicking a screen and 
those end users are loud and vocal and they're concerned about the flickering quote, which we, we've all gotten used to in cash equities. Um, I do think that what we're seeing is liquidity in the FX market fragment into new markets. Uh, and we're seeing new entrants because the, um, the cost of entry is quite low, right? There, there are no exchange filings. There, are no, there is no SEC that approves you. You don't have to file order types. Um, you just build an ECN and hope you can distribute your price uh, effectively and, and attract liquidity. Let, let me be clear that the big banks and dealers um, are the major players in FX and always will be. They have the biggest distribution channels. They have the, the clients directly uh, embedded on their system. They will always be major players, but there is a fragmentation going on among the, the markets themselves, so the Reuters and EBS of the world are, are losing market share to new entrants like Hotspot and, uh, and CurrentX. Um, and so there is fragmentation going on. And uh, there, that what happens when you have that kind of fragmentation is the cost of being the dealer goes up. Do you remember in the 90s NASDAQ traders complaining about ECN fees? <laughs> If you talk to an FX trader at a large bank, you will likely hear complaints about what they call bro, and it's called brokerage, and it's ECN brokerage on EBS, Reuters, and other markets. So their costs are going up, their layoff cost of liquidity is going up, and they're looking to internalize. And one way to internalize is turn on your dark pool. Invite in people that can make markets in FX um, that are sitting on those same uh, ECNs and allow them to make markets in your dark pool, which is free. And so those discussions are long underway in that market. And, uh, and extensive as well because, um, you know, speaking of lack of data, it's very hard to get data on the FX market uh, that's any, anything real. Uh, I remember there was a, uh, an academic from Berkeley by the name of Lyons who made a big, uh, big splash by analyzing a single day's worth of real FX data. And he noted that 90% of that trading was hot potato trading, right, uh, in terms of the dealer market. So this laying off issue uh, is not inconsequential. <clears throat> Anything else from uh, the general audience on FX before we try another asset class? No? Yeah, it's that easy. So I actually would like to turn to Andre because while FX and fixed income have gone through uh, various stages of this evolution already, <clears throat> uh, I think you know swaps and uh, you know related derivatives really are uh, are green fields. And Andre has been working on rules for swap execution facilities. So I'm not sure exactly how to phrase the first question because the economist in me wants to ask what are the economic principles that you're working from. Um, but perhaps um, more cogently, as you look at the issues of pre-trade and even post-trade transparency, uh, what models are you using? Or what examples are you using? I mean, we're, 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 it's sort of the same question as I asked about the equities market. Does it inform us? Thank you, and th thank you for the wonderful question. I'll try to, as best I can, answer the actual question that you are, that yeah. you are asking. Uh, <laughs> and then you can answer another that I haven't. <laughs> and uh, thank you also, Gina, and the conference organizers for, uh, for having me here. It's a great event. Uh, so you, you're, you're absolutely right in that as, uh, as we've been working on uh, Dodd-Frank rulemaking, Dodd-Frank rulemaking sort of, a, it, it comes often and the way you find yourself, it's sort of intersection of uh, uh, regulation, uh, finance, and technology. And this nexus of regulation, finance, and technology is something where uh, you just sort of have to navigate. And what I find myself, uh, I, I often find myself in a situation where I had to look for what are the basic economic principles and paradigms that, that uh, I'd like to rest this whole, uh, 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 th this, uh, th that could be used as a foundation for, for a particular sort of classes of rulemakings. And there are four, you can think of sort of four broad uh, rulemaking areas, if you will, uh, under Title VII and Dodd-Frank. And uh, they're well known, it's, you know, there's a clearing mandate, things that have to do with clearing, uh, something that was not cleared before is coming into clearing. There is, a trans, uh, there is a reporting mandate uh, uh, 
transactions that were not reported before have to be reported to swap uh, data repositories, which is a new regulated entity created by uh, Dot Frank. Uh, uh, and there is uh, uh, one one of these four is is a trading mandate, and uh, Dot Frank uh, Section 733 of the Dot Frank Act created something called uh, swap execution facilities, and uh, there are. There is a number of rules associated with swap execution facilities. Swap execution facilities per se, then there is uh, what is, has to be mandatorily traded on swap execution facilities. Uh, then how what's traded on swap execution facilities is reported. There are various pre-trade and post-trade transparency uh, things. There are issues related to block trading, and there are issues related to uh, price discovery and liquidity. So uh, they're addressed by several different rulemaking, so sort of clusters of rules. Uh, the economic paradigm that uh, uh, is, serves sort of as, as a foundation for this is the costly search and matching paradigm that uh, for which uh, uh, Peter Diamond uh, and, and uh, Chris Pissiridis and, uh, uh, and uh, Dale Mortensen won the Nobel Prize in uh, 2010. And what this model says, basically, there is, there is as you know, the famous uh, diamond paradox. And diamond paradox says that uh, if you have even a very small search cost, uh, then even if you have a lot of buyers and a lot of sellers, prices will, uh, the, the only equilibrium that is stable is a monopolistic price. That is, the buyers or the sellers, whatever side they're looking at. So the sellers would be asking for a monopolistic price, uh, the buyers to pay. And that's a very, very powerful result. It's a, it's, a, it's a corner solution, which is a powerful result that makes us think, you know, how can we reduce the search costs? And what are the search costs associated with this particular market? This paradigm has been uh, applied to labor markets. This paradigm has been applied to other markets in, in the context of Swaps markets, uh, sort of search is, is really quite literal. You know, you have to, uh, in dark markets, you have to pick up the phone and, you know, call your broker and find out what the price is for a swap that you'd like to execute. So pre-trade transparency, uh, uh, which offers it to you for free and significantly reduces the search cost and enables matching with end participants is, is quite critical in reducing that. Uh, Post-trade transparency, uh, there are uh, a number of, so it, it sort of stems from it, and there you have to be, uh, the, the results and both the empirical results from other asset classes and, and the theory behind it uh, seems to be validated, both from the you know, empirical results from the equity side and the corporate bond side. Uh, um, so that's, that's the main paradigm on which we're, uh, we're basing these rules. You look into, and of course you also look at uh, what are the, uh, uh, sort of the limits to transparency, if you will, if I'm allowed to say things like that. So there is an issue with block trades, you know, how much of the block, how, how much would you allow, and when do you allow, and how do you allow the sort of transparency to be, uh, 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 to be uh, to be out there so that for markets to function when somebody wants to execute a block. I mean, do you believe in that personally? I mean, even in equities, we see that not in the United States, obviously, but in Europe, there are certainly rules about, uh, you know, large trades that actually do not have to be reported immediately on the grounds that someone needs time to unwind the position. I mean, is that something you would philosophically agree with? Uh, well, we actually proposed a rule that says just that, so that there is, yes, uh, that is sort of based uh, based on this principle that there needs to be a period of time for an intermediary to work through that uh, large block. And uh, depending on, we've, we've looked at different asset classes, you know, the issue is with, we, we're, we're working with data, of course, that's coming from dark markets and we're looking at sort of histograms of transactions and trying to look at uh, whether or not, for example, these histograms of transactions are in some way bimodal, and you can clearly have a separation where you have larger sizes that are trading quite differently than sort of the rest of the distribution. There is some empirical support for that, and we've sort of presented it to the public for, uh, for notice and comment. I think we've got some comment. I think the way we've sort of dealt with it, more or less, is that to the extent that 
the principle is there, and the data as it comes in from the actual transactions operating under new regulated entities helps to validate a particular detail or a set of details associated with that. Uh, we'll get it right. We just need to make sure that the checks and balances are there. Uh, you know, and, and it's resting on the, on the right foundation so that we can sort of adjust what's the block site, what's the reporting period uh, in, uh, for different asset classes. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's the attitude of the buy side, prevailing attitude, consensus, if you will, Chris, on, well, on hiding, right? Uh, not, not from the point of view of what we think of as an equities as a dark pool trade, but literally hiding disclosure, right, for blocks regardless in fixed income, say. Well, you know, it's interesting. It, it kind of gets into the core dealer function. So if you don't have the natural offset to a trade, an agency trade, well, you know, agency, fine. So at some point, a dealer provides a valuable function. And they're going to step in and meet your need uh, to transact and provide liquidity. But they, in my view as a practitioner, need that sufficient time if they've warehoused some risk to work out of that risk. Mm -hmm. So to me, you know, as a practitioner, that makes sense. Um, you know, what, what's the sort of equation around time limits and, you know, real time versus 15 minutes versus end of day? Um, that can be debated, but I would say that as a general rule of thumb, you need some time to work out of that risk. So you would agree that there are limits to transparency? You know, I look at the way you ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Stop recording. No, I have no uh, agenda here, I promise. <laughs> No, there, there are limits, but if, if, we, uh, if we get back to the principles again, we're trying to, look, you could pick up the phone and you can call a dealer, or you can, in many forms, transact electronically, algorithmically, mm -hmm. and to the extent you pick up the phone, uh, it's, it's a tool in your tool set when you call dealers. To the extent we could move more of that, or as much of that as possible, into a transparent paradigm, I would agree, but I still think there will be some limitations, if you will, to use your, mm -hmm. uh, to that. But I think philosophically, sure, you want to create a mechanism where everything is transparent, everything uh, is viewed um, for a whole host of reasons we've talked about today. But in some cases, uh, I think there are limitations. Mm -hmm. Well, transparency has a cost like anything else. I mean, coming from equities into FX, as you previously mentioned, I mean, how does that play out for you? Um, I mean, it's difficult because um, there are transactions and, and volumes are moving and there's no price. Um, so you have to be um, reliant on what a portion of the market is already transparent. And that portion continues to grow, but it's not the, you know, the entire market. And the derivatives uh, in FX are also less transparent. So the forward market, the swap market, the option market, um, you're not seeing any of that. So you have an entire derivative market just associated with FX, and then you have the spot market, and you know only a small portion of the spot market is actually transparent. Yeah, but isn't it true in, in new ECN designs that you're looking at, at spot forwards and swaps? I mean, really, yeah, almost absolutely. on the same screen. Yeah, so I mean, right now that's you're, breaking down. you're seeing that breakdown in all those other products as well. Um, so you're now seeing forward pricing, you, you don't necessarily see a lot of forward transaction prices, but you do see, you know, a fairly transparent, robust market around um, streaming prices in forwards and swaps and, and even in options. Mm -hmm. And Andre, you know, your, your description of, of what you were doing, I think, is, uh, speak of transparent, it was very transparent, uh, assuming kind of knowledge of mechanics. Can you explain a little bit to uh, the audience what the mechanics of what a CEF would do, right? Literally, just the mechanics. Now, let me start by saying that uh, on, on CEFs in particular, uh, the statute, the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, is, uh, is clear in, in, in uh, is quite clear in a lot of areas. So it, it, it's, it's uh, uh, so the basic sort of construct there is that uh, you, it's a principles-based uh, regulation. That is, uh, there are certain principles that are laid out that anyone who wants to be registered as a SEF 
has to follow. Then you come at it from the other end and you say, look, if, if you uh, are engaged in the following activities, you must be registered as a SEF. And so, so there are registration requirements that, uh, that sort of trigger, there, there are certain activities that trigger registration. And there are also, on the other hand, there are certain uh, things that the statute explicitly does not allow. For example, there is no single dealer SEF allowed under uh, Dodd-Frank. That is, it, you cannot just follow your existing practice by saying, look, you know, I, I used to be a single dealer, now I'm a SEF, mm -hmm. right? So it has to be many to many. Uh, there are certain, uh, you know, sort of notice and comment period, there are certain uh, business models and types of SEFs that uh, people have asked, is this type of activity, is the way we're doing business in the following way, would that be considered a SEF or not? Uh, now, the registration uh, per se, so, could be triggered uh, by a particular activity or an entity may decide to register as a SEF but doesn't necessarily have to follow these activities. It may decide to you know, be registered and become a regulated entity under uh, uh, under Commodity Exchange Act and, and follow only a part, you know, portion of these activities. Uh, if you do, whether you whether you have to register or whether you uh, you decided to register, once you registered as a as a swap execution facility, you have to you know you have to follow the certain sort of protocol. You have to submit your uh, uh, rule book, you have to describe how you're going to do, you have to describe you know, what sort of business model you're going to do, what transactions you're going to be engaged in, or how you're going to do it. That, you know, the Commission has a lot of experience with that because we've been regulating uh, DCMs for a long time, designated contract markets, and so the idea here is that, that uh, a number of principles uh, are, are similar among those, but they're not all similar, so the uh, uh, DCMs have uh, certain principles that SEFs don't have, and SEFs have certain principles that DCMs don't have. Uh, for example, famously, the uh, swap execution facility doesn't have a core principle, DCM core principle nine. Uh, DCM core principle nine, in, in my own words, I, uh, uh, states that uh, anything traded on, uh, uh, on the designated contract market should serve a function, any contract should serve the, a function of price discovery. It has to be, it has to offer price discovery to the market at large. Uh, on the swap execution facility, it doesn't have to. You can have a contract that has nothing to do with price discovery whatsoever. It's just sort of traded there mm -hmm. occasionally, maybe from time to time, borrows prices from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, it just executes on the facility, right? Uh, so it's, uh, I'm sorry I'm giving you sort of a long-winded answer, it's just the, the uh, I'm basically describing the contract, what construct, what triggers what, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the uh, objective is, is sort of not to mandate particular practices or business models, but the objective is to uh, uh, set the boundary and then let the markets figure out what works and what doesn't. Uh, there are certainly a number of participants who came forward and uh, stated uh, both publicly in their comment letters or stated publicly in the various commission meetings that uh, they plan to register as swap execution facilities and these are the business models that they're going to follow and these are, this is how they'd like to do it. There are some who famously have, whom we thought would do that and they said we are not going to. Uh, even though it seemed like a sort of a natural extension of their business, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so there will be there will be a lot of entry into this uh, into this environment. There will be a lot of experimentation, and to the extent that these principles are are satisfied, I think that the, a business model would emerge that serves market participants. That, uh, several business models would emerge to serve market participants in the best way that they could be served. Is there any homogeneity with respect to the business models that have been submitted? I mean, or do they look wildly different? Well, they look quite different. They look <laughs> very, very different in terms of, you know, some, some, base, some are fee-based structures, some are different type of structures, some are look like they have a particular business that uh, they already run, they just sort of basically rename themselves as a SAF. It's already sort of broadly justified, broadly fits the core principles. Some are just sort of designing it from scratch uh, and uh, sort of looking how they could 
position themselves, even though they have not in, they have not even been in that space before at all. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to pause here again, since CEFs are a relatively new concept. We'll certainly take some questions uh, from the gallery. Up there, looks like Richard in the dark. Yep. <laughs> so a uh, quick question, primarily for Andre, is that I've noticed that in recent weeks, a lot of the futures exchanges that have cleared swaps have suddenly announced that they're going to convert those swaps to futures contracts to sort of eliminate a lot of the complexity of, you know, the new Dodd-Frank cleared swap regime. How does that play into the commission's objectives and sort of regulatory mandate under Dodd-Frank? And does that change any of sort of the, the economics that have gone behind the analysis to date? Uh, I think it depends on sort of how you, how you view it. I think the commission is very familiar with the uh, regulating DCMs and regulating futures. And so to the extent that this whole activity is coming into the regulatory framework with which the commission is very comfortable and familiar, and, the, uh, and that uh, rests on the principles with which the public and market participants are familiar. Uh, you can interpret it as just sort of a dot frank working in, in a way as, as uh, it's basically creating greater transparency into it, creating greater both pre-trade and post-trade transparency. Uh, why this particular entities decided to pursue this particular model, they probably have sort of their own reasons uh, based on uh, whatever their committees decided, however they wanted to pursue this. Uh, so I think that uh, sort of broadly there would be, a, uh, I think broadly it's something that uh, sort of remains to be seen but could be interpreted possibly as, as, as positive. Uh, the uh, other sort of interesting things are that, uh, you know, things that used to be called swaps, I mean, it, it's very, very important, for example, to understand that, uh, and, and I think we've stressed it enough that now, or maybe not enough, that market participants know that there's something called uh, exchange of swaps for futures. So you can, you can uh, book something in the swap and then immediately turn it into a futures contract for the purposes of clearing, accounting, uh, segregation of customer funds, and all sorts of things. Uh, I, believe they, I believe we've been very, very clear that even if that swap exists a nanosecond and then it's converted into a futures contract, it's still a swap. It still counts towards a de minimis or swap dealer. It has all the entire dot franc swap regs on top of it for it being swapped for a nanosecond. So that uh, may be one of the reasons, just sort of that uh, that some of the some of the participants came to that realization and thought that some of the possibly models or services or business practices they were following before is not something that uh, is 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 innocuous now. Hopefully that answered your question somewhat. <laughs> I mean, um, I have some thoughts. I mean, I, I think that trend isn't over. Um, I think as things go cleared and you have swaps that are cleared, they begin to look a lot like a future. And then you, if you, you're supporting a, a clearing facility full of swaps, you're starting to wonder, well, shouldn't we just convert these to futures and forego some of the byproducts of, of Dodd-Frank and what that does to the participants? So I, I think that may may happen in the future um, as more and more product goes into a clearinghouse. Um, the gap between a cleared swap and a cleared future is quite narrow, and as you can see with ICE, very narrow, that they can just convert it to a future, and a lot of the issues for their participants, one in particular, um, under the swap dealer definition, cleared swaps and OTC swaps still trigger. They both are treated the same, and they both trigger um, registration as a swap dealer. So they um, have eliminated that issue by converting to futures. Yeah, so Richard, that would also address something that you brought up. In other words, the difficulty in moving from, uh, let's say, uh, a manual market to an electronic market. You know, you can get there by different paths, and I think that's what's being discussed. If it looks like a future and futures already trade electronically, then why not? There are different ways to get there. 
Uh, any other questions before we go on on uh, Ceph's? I see that looks like Joel. Uh, this is a question I think everybody in the panel will have an opinion on, but probably Andre is the most natural. Uh, Ceph's, there are going to be multiple Ceph's, so we, we have a fragmented market. Do you contemplate any kind of measures uh, like Reg NMS uh, to tie these markets together? At this point, no, is, is, a, is a very short answer. Uh, at this point, no. I think that uh, just sort of fundamentally, uh, I, I think that uh, sort of depending, uh, swaps are have sort of, depending on by asset class, have quite different characteristics and quite different just sort of attributes related to them. And uh, maybe one way of thinking about it is, is see how it plays out and then see how in particular asset classes sort of business practices develop. I think one thing that is, that is very, very critical to remember though is that the, there are this new entities created by, uh, by the Crown Court Swap Data Repositories. And so while there will be probably uh, quite a bit of fragmentation on the execution side, uh, there may or may not be as much fragmentation on the reporting side. And so on the reporting side, uh, that's another dimension of, uh, of, of, of this whole market. Uh, so it, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. I mean, my, my thought is given how well Reagan MS has worked out for us, um, <laughs> I'm sure we should put it and impose it on uh, our wonderful SEFs. But, uh, I do agree with you. There will be a lot of SEFs. Um, they will, you know, they will be fragmented. They will all select different clearing houses, so their products will be slightly different based on the clearing facility that they've chosen. Um, but and, and I agree with Andre. You will have transparency first, and you know we had a consolidated tape for many years before we um, came out with the wonderful Reagan MS. Um, so I think you'll get the benefits of transparency, you'll start to, whenever there's transparency, you get the benefits of best execution and fiduciary duties. They start flowing through the market. So you get all the elements of, of trading at the best price uh, rather quickly um, for many of the, the parties that are executing either on an agency basis or a principal basis. Chris, do you have a thought? Yeah, I mean, part of it, it's interesting, you can think about, you kind of back into the portfolio management process and you think, uh, you know, how do I get exposure to the market? Uh, you could buy stocks, you could, you know, S&P 500 basket, you could buy futures, uh, you could buy a put call combo, you could do a swap, you could buy a spider, State Street product. But, so you could, you know, do that in any, you know, five ways. And then the question is, as markets evolve and you think about, okay, what is the point of liquidity? How do you transact? If, if our goal on the buy side is ultimately thinking what's the, in part, the least friction cost, then ultimately we might think about portfolio construction in a way that kind of migrates into one product versus another um, in ease of use. I mean, obviously if you need liquidity and you need an ISDA and you're going to do a swap, well, that's not gonna be great if you need to move in and out of, of, of a position, which is fairly obvious. But, um, you know, it's interesting, a lot of times I think uh, the trading desk and the buy side, you can kind of think of as an exposure management consultant. So as a lot of this develops, it'll be interesting to see how it kind of feeds in, not only through trading, but back into the portfolio construction process. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's, that's actually fascinating. I wonder, I wonder if, uh, you know, going back to the, uh, the story about search, which is absolutely right, uh, whether a, uh, the notion of search can be extended in that way. I mean, wouldn't it be kind of cool in the portfolio construction process if you said, Here's my view. This is my initial leg, right? And up pops, right? The uh, the relevant, let's say, instrument for the portfolio at that time, right? And I actually don't think we're very far away from that, uh, in many ways. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, we've we've talked a bit today, just getting back into the credit discussion, and uh, you know, how do we, you know, get more liquidity? Can there be a central marketplace for credit? I, I think. Um, notwithstanding just the basic market structure challenge of credit, um, perhaps another interesting way is to kind of back into the inventories at the dealers and the buy side. How do you 
think about kind of teasing that out in a way or at least connecting that to try to pull it more into a central marketplace. I mean, ideas like that, um, you know, are things that we're thinking about because obviously to the extent we can do that, we can get the bonds we want. We don't get lists that come to the desk and you have the do not trades that go back, you have to pick another bond. Um, but again, that's, that's an evolution and that takes all parts of the market to make that work. So the point I made earlier, it has to be a collaborative discussion. Again, it's that what's the economic model? How are folks going to be incented to come into a marketplace, provide liquidity, but not in a way where, you know, we kind of think across the decimalization, reg MS for equities, high frequency, and then we kind of go off the scale and a high frequency and some of the bad actors, if you will, versus the legitimate liquidity providers. How do we kind of get to that point, say, in corporate credit? Um, we don't get to that. You know, it doesn't go too far. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you expand on it? I mean, you know, that, that kind of introduces just the general issue of, you know, credit derivatives liquidity, if you like, okay? I mean, uh, where do you see that going? Then? Well, that, that's, that's interesting. I mean, you could start, you could think about credit markets, and again, it's that consumption at the portfolio management level. So if you could say to a portfolio manager, well, um, here's a product, and you don't really care if you you know, buy Ford or GM bonds, but, um, you know, ultimately you just want that exposure uh, and you're trying to lower your idiosyncratic risk in the portfolio. Maybe there's a more, there's a derivative where you could kind of package that together and, you know, get it into the portfolio at a cheaper cost versus thinking in more traditional cash bond terms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's almost like you're trying to skin the market structure cat. You kind of know that it's a dealer-driven market. They have those inventories. Um, but you, but you know that, again, there's, you know, 80,000 QCIPs and in investment grade and high yield, plus or minus, and, you know, a very small amount traded today, and the super liquid point is, is way, you know, is very, that much smaller. So you're trying to think, okay, how do I kind of reverse engineer that? How do I get around it? So there could be some products that you could develop that, that get there and, again, meet the objective of uh, the buy side trader to think, well, I'm lowering frictional cost and getting the right result for my portfolio manager. But. So then you have to start measuring all of this from the portfolio point of view. I mean, you just actually can't go back to where we are in equities today, for example. That would be impossible in that scenario. Well, you know, you use, you use the word measurement, yeah. and it's interesting because we have an in-house multi-asset transaction cost analysis effort. Um, at the end of the day, to, to measure all those frictional costs across asset classes, um, you know, I think equities is, you know, it's kind of like a solved problem. Okay, we understand equities. I think mm -hmm. FX has gotten a lot better. Um, new products coming out, fixed income is sort of in the nascent stage and what do you look at? But that measurement piece is something that even within the buy side, we didn't have to think about as much 15 years ago. We think an awful lot about it today because when we get in front of our clients, we have to demonstrate best execution and how are you measuring uh, your, your execution quality in the context of thousands of trades? And really it demonstrates to think, okay, well, what is your entire process? And, and clients want to see that more and more. So as, and this is for everybody, um, but before I do, I see a question in the audience. I'd like to defer to that. So liquidity is ultimately uh, buyers looking for sellers and sellers looking for buyers. And when the buyers and sellers are looking for uh, different instruments or, or um, highly correlated risks, but they're not the same thing, then it's going to be hard for them to find each other and you'll need a bunch of intermediaries. So the question is, is what processes do you see uh, developing or uh, continuing to develop that will standardize contracts and um, uh, both in the swaps area and uh, perhaps in uh, fixed income, what processes are going to discipline issuers to get them to uh, stop, stop issuing so many different uh, names and, and try to con consolidate their names into uh, single issues with secondary offerings that will, will um, make it easier for buyers to find sellers and vice versa. Okay. Yes, go for it. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, excellent, excellent question. I think one of the uh, things that I'd like to emphasize about uh, Dot Frank that perhaps is, uh, especially title, title Seven, that perhaps is not, not as appreciated uh, widely is, is the standardization, is the benefits of standardization. Uh, I think this, this benefits come through, through uh, the clearing mandate only some contracts would be mandatorily cleared, and through the trading mandate, only some contracts would be, only some swaps would, be, would have to be mandatorily traded. And so once these determinations are made, these are sort of your natural candidates, and because they will have standardized attributes, 
uh, that uh, th that would uh, uh, concentrate liquidity among those uh, among those very specific uh, instruments. Another uh, important area in which there is standardization, even though it's you know it, it goes for both Title One and Title Eight, is is the various uh, entity product and and uh, uh, transaction and identifiers that currently do not exist in there. It's on the legal entity identifier in particular, there has been a lot of progress. Uh, CFTC has designated uh, an entity to be an interim provider of these entity identifiers. Uh, on the product identifier in the swaps area, there's been also a lot of progress. Uh, and so uh, there is uh, what what you know what what happens once you have this identifier it's not necessarily sort of liquidity related per se but it's related to uh risk management uh both internally and and regulatory compliance externally because you can monitor what sort of exposures across portfolios across types of participants uh market participants have but they are literally embedded into uh, uh into the structure of the instrument and so they would probably over time play a role as well as, as having sort of a standardization vehicle simply because uh, sort of uh, inertia or not or liquidity or not sort of market participants will say, well, this is something that we already know. We know what it is. You know, we know, we know what it does. There are, of course, always issues with that. You want to make sure that uh, contracts like that do not experience sort of structural shifts, so there is structural shift in the market and the contract terms have not changed, then it's an issue. Uh, but again, the commission has experience with that. Excellent question. Any follow-ups? Yes. Yeah, I was wondering if we could just um, ask one question, actually a uh, commodity market question. Um, I was wondering if uh, the C if Andre, if you could comment on, you know, preliminarily what the CFTC has found uh, related to Monday's uh, incident, the oil flash crash, and whether um, there was any role uh, with high frequency traders or algo traders in that incident, and what you know you may do going forward. Thanks. Uh, if I may, perhaps uh, Sarah, if, if may, perhaps I could uh, comment on background to you and then you can publish it, and then the rest of the crowd could read it. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a big camera in front of me. <laughs> that sounds like a no. Um, <laughs> it's a great question, by the way. <laughs> awesome question. It was only four bucks, come on. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, I, I'm about to, to close out uh, because we do have follow-up speakers on a tight schedule. Uh, I'm about to break a promise that I made to this panel, but uh, I think it's a useful one to, uh, to follow up with. I mean, as we talk about the state of credit market liquidity and we talk about the evolution of these markets towards a more electronic and standardized framework, which obviously also has liquidity implications, uh, where does the Volcker rule fit in, in your estimation? And that is for all three panelists, and then we'll call it a day. Well, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I, I, I watched the, um, the life of the Volcker rule, and um, it was kind of flapping in the wind uh, earlier in the year, and suddenly we had the J.P. Morgan issue, and so now I, I refer to it as the J.P. Morgan rule. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I think it has major Im implications on how a dealer can uh, be a dealer in products that they actively deal in to their clients. Um, uh, some of those implications are not clear at this point because there's a lot of interpretive, interpretive issues right now. Um, but uh, the market maker exemption and how you stay within the four walls of that exemption is, is going to be critical in how a dealer can continue to deal. Um, so I, I do think the Volcker Oil has major implications uh, going forward, and, and uh, there'll be a lot of discussion, I think, for years to come around what those exemptions mean. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think, um, you know, I think there was a feeling, call it earlier in the year, and you start to think about, okay, well, what are the guardrails on proprietary trading, market making, and think about agency trading, and where the line is between market making and prop trading or agency and market making. 
Um, so it has, so, and I think that generated some concern. That said, um, as has been our experience at State Street, um, you know, there are conversations around this. So something comes out and you, you work with regulators, you have those conversations. So my sense is when all is said and done, it will, and again, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but it will end up in the right place, uh, despite the initial concern. So I think, uh, you know, that, that's, it'll end up in a place where I think it makes sense for market participants. And um, I have every confidence of that. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, as you know, Volcker rule is, is the rule in which all FSOC member agencies are, are, are participating, and so, and there are lots of stakeholders, and I think the process, the way the process has evolved is that uh, there's a very large number of stakeholders in this, and there are a very large number of regulators who are, have, in some capacity, regulatory oversight over, over these stakeholders in this rule. I think that, uh, the, as far as I know, from, is from my uh, participation in FSOG, the process just sort of continues, and, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a prescribed and public process that, that involves, you know, just lots and lots of stakeholders, and I think you can say that it's, uh, uh, it has to be sort of that way. I mean, you, you have to bring a large number of participants who are, uh, who's, who have a stake in it together, and the regulators who have a stake in it together. And, uh, and come up with an outcome. So from a fraudist perspective, I'm, I'm seeing uh, that the process is uh, sort of not slowed down. It's significantly underway. It's, uh, there is momentum behind it. There are, things are happening. In terms of the actual outcome and how things will play out, I think it really depends a lot on uh, uh, just sort of interplay among different uh, uh, sort of regulatory boundaries and, and particular influences that particular stakeholders have and all sorts of other things. Uh, so, but the process is certainly on the way. Mm -hmm. All right, so moderator's privilege to have just a little bit of last word, and now I can make it clear why, uh, why I broke my promise not to mention Volcker. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as the discussion has gone on, what Part of what's come out, at least to me, is a belief that even as these other asset classes move in an evolutionary manner, that the dealer, as we understand uh, him or her today, will continue to exist. All right? That seems to have been a predicate in many of these statements. Uh, I would simply point out that if we were going to learn a lesson from the equity markets, it might be that that's not necessarily true, that we have seen cycles of disintermediation of the dealer function. Uh, and dealers have risen again, but in very different guises in many ways. And as standardization of instruments has occurred, uh, the very market structure that they exist on also has changed in ways that has disintermediated certain parties and forced a reintermediation in terms of novel uses of the technology and uh, available uh, human capital. So I'm not quite so sure that you know opinions today based on the definition of dealer today, all right, will necessarily survive. And since the Volcker rule really is about dealers in a way, all right, um, I think that's inclusive. And with that, I will end. Please join me in thanking the panel very much. They are excellent. <laughs>